Good day, YouTube. Warbles on a lot here. On a dump run. And it's a cloudy day. Which means pretty good for filming. So I thought we'd go for a bit of a drive. I mean, I'm going on a drive, but it's no great, huge effort to stick on a head camera. from Armadale to Tenerfield. That thing was, uh, well the track was bulldozed about the year I was born. It was constructed and switched on by 1963. So we're talking a 50 year old power line and it's all got the original wooden poles. With holes drilled into them every 10 years to see if the wood's gone rotten yet. The power grid in Australia has been constructed in a just-in-time to meet demand fashion as the population has risen. When those poles were put up, there was only about 11 or 12 million people in Australia. There's now 22 million. We haven't maintained the assets that were put there 50 years ago. <coughs> the latest phenomenon to hit the power distribution grid is what they call a death spiral. That means that population has come to the conclusion that electricity is too expensive to waste. So power consumption has been decreasing. I think it's dropped 7% in Australia over the last five years. Power consumption has gone down in absolute terms, but the cost of doing emergency maintenance repairs following damage to we from weather events to the grid has meant that the cost of maintaining the existing grid has been increasing even though the amount of power it delivers has been decreasing therefore in spite of the fact that the people who are wired up to the grid have been using less electricity their power bills are still rising Therefore they can't afford to use as much electricity so they cut back even further. So the price per unit is doomed to continue to rise <coughs> until it gets to the point that nobody can afford to buy grid power. <coughs> and it could be in fact that this is why state governments all over Australia have been desperate to quote privatise, i.e. sell off, the state electricity grids.
It's a bit of a worry if you live connected to the grid. Personally, I don't live connected to the grid. Because I didn't ever want to be dealing with a situation that meant I was totally at the mercy of somebody 300 miles away with a coal-fired electric power station. It's really funny, this electric distribution business idea. Once upon a time there was an argument between Tesla and Edison because Edison reckoned that direct current was the way to go. Tesla said alternating current is a better idea because you can transmit it further. That means the distance between your power stations increases. In densely populated countries, that doesn't matter a lot, but in widely sprinkled countries like Australia, yeah it does. town nearest where I live, a place called Glen Innes, it actually had a municipal electric grid with a steam driven boiler in the 1880s. Places like <coughs> Tamworth and Armadale, much bigger, much more important towns cities, they didn't go electric until well into the 20th century because they were big enough to have acquired gas street lights. So, once upon a time, like when I was a baby, trains used to bring coal to Glen Innes and there was a carrier employed to take the coal from the train to the power station where it was burnt to make steam run a generator to power the town. I think in about year 63, 64, the town's generator was taken offline and put into a reserve backup spare capacity, kept maintained, and the town was connected to the grid. And at that time, we were going to get our power from Ashford Power Station, which is, uh, 100 kilometres away and it has a supply of coal that's filthy and dirty and very expensive to burn because you keep having to pull the power station to pieces and clean its boiler pipes and it stinks. So <coughs> Ashford power station was burning coal that was carried up to it on a train from Newcastle and they decided that was a bit silly. So, Ashford Power Station was closed and this whole area here gets its electricity from Newcastle. About 300 miles overland. Which always seemed a strange way of doing it, but when I started reading New Scientist magazine, I came across a really strange facet of the situation. In terms of pure thermodynamics, I read in there that the distance over which it becomes more efficient to build a railway line and carry the coal and burn it when you get to the place where you want the energy release is 48 kilometres, about 27 miles, maybe 30 miles. If you want the energy to be used more than 30 miles away from where you're going to have the power station, it's cheaper to build a railway line in terms of pure energy efficiency. Here we have the throbbing metropolis of Dundee.
biggest contribution to Australia is this road safety speed camera. Allegedly only installed to keep track of heavy vehicles between specific points to make sure the drivers are not averaging an illegal speed. And I'm pretty sure they photograph number plates as well. In fact, for people who are inclined to worry about government surveillance, security industry intrusions and computer interconnections, <coughs> it's interesting to note that the registration label over there in the top left corner of my windscreen is an obsolete unit. It's a museum piece. Last time I paid my registration, I was told, we're not going to give you a sticker anymore. And I said, ah, so does that mean that the cameras they have inside the highway patrol cars, which are running permanently and any time the officer turns his lights on, the camera goes into a, a storage loop, are they good enough to pick up number plates and identify an unregistered vehicle? And the RTA worker or Department of Maritime Services worker refused to answer the question. <coughs> a couple of months afterwards, it became public knowledge that each highway patrol car has three cameras, one looking forward, one looking left, one looking right. They've got a high enough definition and resolution that they can read number plates out to a couple of hundred metres. And they started collecting data in 2009. So they got four years worth of data. Apparently they have stored images equivalent to 37 or 39 for each car that's registered, each vehicle that's registered in New South Wales. And the system is sensitive enough and fast enough that while driving in six lane city traffic, a highway patrol officer who has a screen display over here where people like us, we're not allowed to talk on a mobile phone, but they're allowed to interact with a computer and receive text messages, emails in real time, as they're driving, if they pull up at the traffic lights, they might have been sitting there for 10 seconds when they get a display message that says the black four-wheel drive in the next lane in front of you has been photographed at three funerals for outlaw motorcycle gang members, the occupants may be dangerous. That's how closely surveilled the city's ends of New South Wales are. And nobody complained over much. I mean, when it was announced as a, <coughs> a fait accompli, there was a bit of a blurb about it by the civil libertarians, but nothing's been done to overturn the situation. We're not going back to registration stickers. They're not taking the cameras out of the police cars. So what sort of metadata statistical analysis can you do if you cross-reference everywhere that a person's number plate has been photographed by a police car? And then you've got all the stationary pickup cameras as well. It's an interesting question, isn't it? George Orwell was not particularly far wrong. And uh, just add that on to everything that you already know about what the American National Security Agency and the Australian Secret Intelligence Agency has already got. Listening, watching, monitoring, observing, looking for anomalies, seeking out the disgruntled, trying to monitor and predict anybody who has a propensity 
to disagree violently with the um, the proclaimed national interest, which is by definition indefinable. It's a worry. But as you can see, country that's not overgrazed deals better than country that is overgrazed. That place is always bare rocks. because nobody's allowed to farm it. That cops grazing by transient cattle herds and sheep herds very occasionally. <coughs> but compared to the paddocks out there in farmer land, it's doing pretty well. railway bridge. Once upon a time we had trains. But as the economists say, you use it or you lose it. And with the rise in popularity of the private motor car in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, the use of passenger rail service diminished sort of geometrically to a point where um, the government said, oh no, everybody's going to go on a bus up the road run by the government railway servant or department. Well, they're going to buy themselves a car. So that track over there, it hasn't been maintained for ooh, probably 25 years. Maybe more. I wonder how long it'll be before New South Wales reverts to railways. Interesting question. there once upon a time. A bunch of surviving wild roses. Oxham's Creek. Once upon a time there was a bland called Oswald Bloxham. He had a huge estate. Progressively his descendants sold off bigger and bigger bits of it. 
95 years or so ago. His great grandson, I think it must have been, sold off the last. Whoa! Dicton 1, you never drive over a box. Dicton 2, you don't drive into the car that's on the correct side of the road. Therefore, you have to modify Dicton 1 and run over the box because it's only half a box and it's foam styrene and it does not appear to be concealing a child, which some boxes do, which is why you should never run over a box. Just one of those crazy bits of road safety law, L-O-R-E, which is in the book. Quite a few people have finished up going to jail and hating themselves for the rest of their lives because they drove over or backed over a cardboard box with a kid playing hidey go seek inside of it. It's a bit like people who leave a derelict refrigerator with the door on. Some kid gets trapped in it. But anyway, all doctrines have to be flexible according to actual circumstance. Can't go crashing the car to avoid running over a box. these unlined roads. A lot of the locals habitually drive in the centre of the road so they've got more time to avoid kangaroos. See this fella in front of us going into a blind corner on the centre line. A lot of people do it. Tips only open for four hours on Thursdays, two hours on Saturdays and two hours on Sundays. So you actually do it, get to see rush hour at the deep water dump. People who live on properties generally save up a couple of months worth anyway. I know I do. My dump trips are regulated by the beer bottles in the 44 gallon drum. Notice scavenging prohibited within landfill. Yes. There you go. 